Welcome to Jesus City Online. My name is Jason Powell, and I'm the pastor of Jesus City Church here in Montgomery, Alabama. And I'm so glad that you're joining us for church today to hear one of our messages. Listen, our heart, our goal as a church is to push you closer to Jesus, that you would know God and you would make God known. I invite you to be a part of our church, to be a part of the family. You can just go to our website, go to jesuscitychurch.com, and you can find out about more resourcing and groups really some items to help you be more in love with the Lord, to help you feel encouraged in your relationship with God. But today, the message, I know that God's going to speak to you. I know that God's going to encourage you. And so I ask that you would just listen to it with a ready heart and hang in there. At the very end of our message, I've got some important things that I want you to know about, about the church and how you can be a part of what God is doing here at Jesus City. The title of my message this morning is, What is Repentance? What is repentance? Now, before you get up and leave, because uh, you feel like you're going to, I think you're going to be encouraged today, so, so don't, don't despair. Uh, it's going to be a blessing for you. But before we get into God's word, join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. God, we quiet our hearts. We have raised our voices to you, but now, Lord, we ask that you would raise your voice, that we would hear from you, your Holy Spirit, today. Lord, we quiet our hearts, we ready our minds. Lord, we are, we are on edge waiting to hear from you. And so, Lord, I pray you would show up in a powerful way. Again, we invite you into this place. And I pray that you would illuminate your word to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, last year for our anniversary, my wife and I, you know, we typically don't get each other like big anniversary presents, but this one, I, I wanted to get her something special. And so I had called around and I tried to find a piano uh, for my bride. You know, back in California, she had an upright piano that she played on a regular basis. Like she can play. Let me tell you, that girl is talented. And, uh, and so we got here, I couldn't bring the piano. And so she like kind of made a comment, you know, like, well, I kind of miss my piano. And I'm like, noted. Okay. You know, so an anniversary came around and so I'm like looking for a piano and, and all of my leads had failed. I couldn't find anything on Facebook marketplace. And so I'm like, man, and last minute, someone in the congregation, so kind said, you know what? We have a family piano. It's been in the family all these years. We want to bless you with it. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. And it was an upright, dark wood, beautiful piano. We get it moved into the house. It weighed like a thousand pounds. They don't make things like they used to. Let me tell you, this thing was heavy, but we got it in the house and it's all set up. Red bow. She comes downstairs. Oh my goodness. She goes over to start playing it. And I didn't even think about it. Soon as she started playing, what did she find out? Man, that thing was so out of tune. It sounded like a donkey. Like, I think it was like, it was bad, bad, bad. I'm like, oh, man. So then I'm like, all right, well, I'm sorry, dear. Let me find a piano tuner. So I'm Googling. Now, let me tell you what I found in Montgomery. Pretty amazing find. There is a gentleman. His name is Thomas the Piano Man. And he is an older gentleman. He's 85 years old. Okay, so I contacted. He came to the house and he's blind. Okay, he's a blind 85-year-old. So he walks up to my front door. I'm like, you know, hey, he's blind. He's legit blind. You know, his son's there. And I'm like, uh, how are you going to tune my piano when you're blind? And he's like, oh, I've been doing this since I've been 12. You know, I'm like, okay. He literally walks over my piano. He feels it, you know, and he's feeling, he's like, oh, this is a 1915, you know, like he knew it by the feel of it. I'm like, wow, this is impressive. He takes off the front of the piano and he starts feeling the springs and, and with his fingers. And all he has are two tools. He's got a tuning fork and a wrench. And I'm like, that's all you need? This is all I need. I'm like, okay. And so he feels the chords, he feels the strings, and then he starts playing the piano. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is, this is probably one of the worst sounding ones I've heard, you know? <laughs> he's like, but I can fix it. I said, okay, I'll let the master do his work. And he struck the tuning fork and he started to feel and he pulled out his wrench and he started to turn these screws. And as you know, a, a piano is kind of like a guitar where it's got a string around the screw. And so you have to turn the, the screw in tightening and turning the screw. It'll, it'll put the string in such a place that it'll be in tune. You turn it the proper way and it tunes the piano. All 88 keys he had to go across and, and he was there all day long. And there was one that was really bad. I mean, I was like, hey, we can just throw that out, you know? Like, I'll tell my wife not to play that key, you know? And he's like, no, 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 trust me on this. Trust me on this. I'm like, okay, I'll trust you on this. And sure enough, he took his time, each string, tuning, listening, turning it. What was he doing? He was redirecting, realigning, recalibrating, repositioning. It's called repenting. 
Repentance is a turning of something that puts it in proper tune with what it's been out of tune with. This morning, your life might be out of tune with God. You might look across all the keys of your life and realize there's a lot of things that aren't the way they're supposed to be. It's not playing right. It doesn't sound good. The solution is easy. You need to turn. Turn your life. Continue to churn it. Crank your life down. Turn it toward God. And in so turning toward God, your life will be put in tune. It'll play a musical sound. It'll be something so beautiful and melodious that that people around you will be attracted to what God is doing in your life. The Christian life is one where our life is in tune with God because we've turned our life, we've turned everything in our life to God. And that's the topic this morning, repentance. Let me define it for you. Repentance is an active and constant turning. It's a tuning a redirecting, a rerouting, a repositioning, a reconfiguring of our lives with God. The tuning fork makes it sound and we adjust to that. Where all of a sudden our life, it changes. Our direction changes. Everything about where we're going adjusts toward its proper destination. This idea, this concept of repentance and with the piano, I think it's one of the best illustrations that my wife actually came up with just a few days ago. And I was like, babe, that's genius. I love it. And I, but I think it really illustrates what the Bible teaches on this topic about repentance. Now, John the Baptist was a guy that the first words out of his mouth when he spoke to the multitudes was he told the multitudes they needed to what? They needed to repent. He told everybody that was coming to hear him, you all need to repent. And get right with God. He says, you need to get right with the Lord. Turn to the Lord. Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, we found out last week about this guy named John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist doesn't belong to the Baptist denomination. You know that. John the Baptist, really, that's a title given to a man who was known for calling people to repentance, baptizing them in that confession. Where people were saying, look, we need to turn our life to God. He's like, if you turn your life to God, I'll punk you and dunk you right here as a witness to the world. And so they were coming in droves and multitudes to be baptized because they were turning their lives over to the Lord. Now, John was a man that was unique in several ways. Not only did he live in simplicity, what we learned last week. Remember, he had like camel's hair and he ate locust and honey. Remember that? Not not a diet too desirable nowadays, uh, but that's John the Baptist, living in the wilderness, dressing kind of interesting. So he lived in simplicity. He had no distractions between him and God. But then also he lived with honesty. He spoke the truth. John was a man that did not pull the punches. If somebody was far from God, he would tell him, you're far from God. You need to get right with God. You need to turn your life over to the Lord. I respect that about John the Baptist that he spoke the truth. Man, I wish more people would speak the truth today, the biblical truth, that people would stand for the word of God. And if we want to turn our culture around, I'm telling you, there's only one solution, and it's not the White House. It's God's house. It's hearing the word of God spoken. And so John the Baptist was speaking boldly and confidently, telling people, you need to to turn your life over to the Lord. He also lived with humility, though. He was a humble man. And I respect, again, this about John. John was a man that was born for one predominant reason. He was making a way for Jesus to come on the scene. If you remember, he's called the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Now, to help me and you understand what a forerunner is, it would be like an MC at a large, say, conference when a when a person comes up and they say, listen, today you're going to hear some amazing speakers. And it's an MC. You've got someone hosting the event. But John was the host, the MC for the main attraction, Jesus Christ. John was like an appetizer to a main meal. You know, John's like, listen, I just want to prep your taste buds for the bread of life because he's around the corner. John was like a movie trailer, getting everybody ready, letting them know that the grand release that Jesus Christ was close by. And so his job was just to let people know that they needed to get ready for Jesus. I I used this last week. It's kind of like when you're at work and, uh, you know, you're over there, say, chopping it up with your coworker. You know, you're just just fellowshipping. You're just hanging out. Like, what's going on? How's your week? And you're not at your desk. You're not doing what you're supposed to do, but you're just, you know, hanging out. And as you're chopping it up, all of a sudden you hear that the boss is on the way. 
And immediately, like, oh, no, you know, like, so you run over, you know, and you start pretending like you've been there the whole time. You, we all know you're not. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, 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 how's it going? How's it going, boss? Good to see you. Yeah, making progress, you know. Uh, the boss is around the corner, and so you immediately, you know, you snap into shape. You know, you get back to it. John's telling the people, God is close, and you better be ready. He's, he's right around the corner, and your heart needs to be turned to him. Let me show it to you from the text. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. This is what John the Baptist was doing. Verse 1, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Verse 2, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and food was locust and wild honey. Then all Jerusalem and Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. The first words out of John the Baptist's mouth was that they needed to repent the first point I have about the topic of repentance this morning is this. Repentance, first and foremost, is an invitation. An invitation before anything else. Repentance is an invitation. An invitation from God to you. Not only did John the Baptist uh, really start his public ministry with that word repentance, but did you know there was another guy a little more important who also started his public ministry with that word repentance? Who was it? Yeah, Jesus Christ. Did you know Mark chapter 1, verse 15, this is what it says, Jesus speaking. So the first words out of Jesus' mouth, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. The God-man himself, starting his ministry, goes out to the multitudes and he calls all of them to repent. He calls into the dark. He calls into their mess. He calls into their messy lives and all of the things that they've been doing. And he tells all of them they need to turn their hearts toward him. This word, repentance, as I said, it's an invitation. Invitation from God initiating and calling you to himself. Listen, repentance is God calling out in the darkness of your life. Where he's calling out to you, come to me. It's God intervening in just your your sin and the direction of your life and everything you've been doing, God intervening himself. And he says, turn to me. He's that still small voice that you've heard, the God leaving the 99, coming after you, the one saying, you need me. You need me. Repentance is God telling us to come to him, turn to him, turn toward him, draw near to him, repent, turn to me. And that's exactly what the message is. Now, verse two John the Baptist, he kind of describes it a little bit. He says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you see that there? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? Uh, really, that word at hand doesn't exist in the, the Greek translation of the New Testament. It just says the kingdom of God has come near. Literally saying, the kingdom that's up top has come down. It's close to you, so you better get ready. Jesus Christ has crossed heaven to earth to come close to you. So you should turn your heart and your life to him. The message from John the Baptist was very basic. It was very easy and it was alluring. John told everybody to redirect their attention, recalibrate their life, reroute their life to him. Now we understand this, which by the way, I'm going to really belabor this point today because it's a simple message. What is repentance? But I want you to get it. I think there's a lot of misunderstandings. And so I'm wanting us to get it today to reroute your life to God. If right now all of us pulled out our phone and we typed in Birmingham, Alabama, and we put it into our GPS and we allowed it to, you know, start the route right now, we would all get a, a path to Birmingham. Now, no matter what way you took out of the building, let's just say that you took a few different turns and no matter which direction you go, what's so lovely about our devices is they will reroute, rerouting, you know, like recalculating your, they will reroute it automatically for you. So no matter how far you get away from Birmingham, it'll constantly reroute you where you're supposed to go. And this is 
really what it means to be a believer. That no matter where you're at in life, your heart is set at the destination of Jesus Christ. Where you've erased all of the motives and all of the agendas. You've wiped the slate clean and you've written him upon your heart. And you say, God, you are my aim. God, you are my focus. You are my destination. My, my GPS is set to God. And so wherever he's at, that's where I want to be. And, and I want to focus on that and, and be all about that. That is what it means to repent, to make God your primary focus of your life, the new target, the new destination. Now, as I said, there are some misunderstandings about this topic of repentance. Unfortunately, some Bible translations have actually helped with this. And so I want to show you what I'm talking about. Did you know, I did some research this week. I could not find one verse in the Bible, in the original language, that said this word, repent of your sins. Did you know that? We've heard it a lot, have you not? My entire life, I've preached it, to be honest with you. I've told people, repent of your sins. But the more and more I looked, the word repent of your sins is not in the original. It doesn't say repent of your sins, repent from your sins, repentance of sins, or repentance from your sin. 75 occurrences of metanoia in the Greek and, and different, sure, these different words of the Hebrew, none of them actually connect repentance to repentance specifically of sin. Rather, it connects it to a turning to something not from, but turning to something. Now, two verses I did find, Ezekiel says to repent and turn away from your idols, so that's close. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, repented of the impurity, so that's kind of close, but there are no other verses that mention it. But unfortunately, your Bibles have. Do any of you have the New Living Translation here this morning? Here we go, right in the front. Uh, what does our verse, Matthew 3, 2, say in yours? Repent of your sins and turn to God. Yeah. Yeah, it says, repent of your sins and turn to God. What's interesting is hamartia in the Greek is the Greek word for sin. It doesn't exist. It's not in there. So I don't know why the Bible translators added it, but I just want to really belabor something this morning that I think is very important, and I'm going to show you why. The Bible is more about us turning to God with what we gain than making life all about the things that you have to give up. And let me help you understand. Why does it matter that we focus more on gaining God than you giving up your sin? Like, why is it more important? Because I think it is. Why is it more important we make our Christianity more about turning to Jesus than you just turning away from the wrongs in your life? Here's why. Turning from your sin is not the same thing as you turning to Jesus. Amen. Think it through. Think it through, Bible scholars. Turning from your sin is not the same thing as you turning your life over to Christ. Let me prove it. Man, let me just say that, did you know it's possible for you to work really, really hard on being a really good person? It's possible for you to cut back on all the wrongs in your life, quit cussing, quit watching the wrong stuff, put down the bottle, put down the smokes. You, you, you start working on you. You know, it's New Year's. We got resolutions. You've got a bunch of non-believers out there doing resolutions and even people that claim it. We could actually work really hard on being a better person where I'm good, I'm better, my life looks good, I'm an upright guy. I could do all of that, but did you know I could still be lost? There are plenty of people I know in Montgomery that work hard, don't cheat on their taxes, have good families, fun to be around. They'll help you, but they don't know Jesus. Goodness is not a prerequisite for you to get into heaven. Jesus Christ is. You can have a good life and not have Jesus and still end up in hell. Did you know that? This is a truth that me and you need to ingrain into our lives. That we could have it all, but not have him. It reminds me of that one young man. He was a rich young ruler that came up to Jesus one day. Don't you remember the story? This young man who had life together. He had been a good guy. He came up to Jesus and he said, good teacher. How can I have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know, why don't you uh, look at some of these commandments? And Jesus gave him a bunch of commandments. And his response was, I've kept all of those commandments from my youth. I'm a good guy. I've done it. I've kept all of the law. So, I mean, here's a good guy that's done what the, the law commands. And Jesus is still not his. And so the Jesus says, okay, you've done well. 
And it says that Jesus loved him. Jesus said, why don't you sell everything you have and give it to the poor and repent? Turn and follow me. Jesus says, follow me. Why don't you follow me? Why don't you come after me? And the guy says, nah, it's too much. It's too much. It's easier to live a good life than it is to follow Jesus. Did you know that? It's easier. It's easier for you to have a really good year and a really good motive in life and, and be a good mom and a good dad. It's easier to do that. And it'll gain you nothing, but it's easier than it is to actually turn your life to follow Jesus Christ. This rich young man who had it all together, he missed out completely because he didn't have Jesus. Listen, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were good, but they didn't have Jesus. The religious people were living lives of upright behavior, but they were lost. Turning from your sin is not the same thing as turning to Jesus. Repentance that does not turn to Jesus is not real repentance. That is the focus this morning. That me and you are gaining something when we turn our lives over to God. It's not about, you know, the things that we do and the things we don't do, but it's about who, who we get. We get the Savior of the world. That we get Jesus Christ in the flesh. That he loves you. He laid his life down for you. He knows everything about you. He's never neglected you. He's never left you. He's never going to. The Bible tells us of his great love. He loved you in your mess and in your dark and in the worst of the worst. He loved you. It's about what we gain in Christ in repentance. I turn to him and I get God. It's incredible. It's nothing compared to the little bit of trash I got to give up. Like the little broken marbles that I've got over here when I gain so much in Christ. Do not make more about what you give up than what you gain. We gain more than we ever give up. Two other reasons why I think this is important is because, well, it prevents two things. It prevents you to have the false sense of success in your life. And also a, a false sense of condemnation. You know, and these two are really big. False sense of success. When you do really, really well as a Christian, like say you're having just a really good year, really good month, week, you name it. You're just, you're, you're owning it. You're reading your Bible and you're going to church and, you know, like you're sharing your faith and you're just on cloud nine as a Christian. You're doing amazing. If you make your focus predominantly upon your performance, you know what something will start to creep up in your heart? Pride. Pride's going to start to creep in. Why? Because when I start focusing on what I've accomplished, what I've turned from, what I'm giving up, the sins that I'm avoiding, the self-control I'm exerting, the temptation I'm avoiding, the flesh that I'm killing, or the sinless streak that I'm keeping, I suddenly begin to believe that law-keeping is the secret to the Christian life, when it's not. It's not about law-keeping. It's about God-keeping. It's not about your performance. And it also, you'll suddenly start to believe that God loves you because you're doing those things. Well, I got a lot of people that think, hey, oh yeah, God loves me because I keep it at 10 and I don't make mistakes. But that is a really hard treadmill to stay on of the Christian life that it's not meant to be. That you're exhausting yourself like a Pharisee thinking I got to keep these things and God will be pleased with me because of my performance. He's pleased with you on your best day and on your worst day. Did you know that? Because it's, I'll take that. I'll take that. Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus. What he did for us that day on the cross, Calvary, his death, his burial and resurrection. That's the focus. I'm acceptable in the beloved because of what he's done for me, not because of what I try to do for me. And that is beautiful. My joy and my delight, my peace and my comfort come from my relationship to Jesus Christ, not my goodness, not my ability to do the right things on a regular basis. The Bible tells us, Romans 5, 8, God loves and God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you when you were still a sinner, okay? When you were in the dark, messing up, oh, the Lord loved you, sent his son to die for you. Okay, so... When we view repentance the right way of turning to God, it'll keep you from pride, but it'll also keep you from condemnation when you do really bad. And that's probably a few of us in this room. When you've had a bad performance week, when your Christianity doesn't look too good on paper, you know what I mean? Like your resume is like failure, failure, failure. All the keys of your life are out of sync. You know what I'm saying? Like you told God, I'm not going to do it again. Lord, I'm sorry. I, I, you, you pled with him and you begged him. Oh, Lord, I'm not going to do it again. But then lo and behold, uh, 
And you find yourself back in the same spot. Am I, am I alone in that? No. The Christian life is one that we, we are failing forward. But there, there are real, real times of struggle in the Christian life. But if you view it that God only loves you when you keep your performance, then what type of God is that? He found you in the dark. He's the one that's pulling you out of it. I'm so thankful that God loves me and doesn't stop loving me when I do bad. I mean, I think about an example of Peter. Don't you remember? Like, if we can look at any case study, look at Peter. We got Peter who walked with God for three years. Some of you have been a Christian for three years, maybe a little bit longer. Peter walked with God, walked with Christ every day. He's there with him. It comes to the final hour of Jesus' life. And Peter, hey, Jesus, my man, my dog, what up? Hey, I'm not, I will never turn my back on you, Jesus. Jesus says, well, Pete, three times before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. Peter says, man, no way. It's not going to happen, Jesus. I will not deny you. Fast forward just a few hours. Peter straight up denying Jesus. Not once, three times. And it gets worse all along the way. The final one, he's like, I, he curses and says, I, I swear I don't know that man. And then the rooster crows. We've got a guy that walked with Jesus three years and denies him three times. You would think maybe Jesus would wipe his hands with him. Like, all right, Peter, you denied me. I'm done. But the resurrection happens. As soon as the resurrection happens, Jesus tells the ladies, go tell the disciples and Peter. Then Jesus himself goes and hunts out Peter when Peter is out fishing. Jesus takes a little bit of coals and some fish and he lays it, makes a little breakfast for both of them. If you remember in the book of John, John 21, Peter's out fishing. Peter realizes there's a man on the shore. He thinks it's Jesus. Peter jumps in the water, swims over to Jesus, and he's standing there dripping wet. Hey, where'd you get the fish? You know, they sit down, they enjoy a little breakfast together. You would think maybe Jesus would bring words of condemnation, words of correction. Jesus remembers like, hey, remember what happened just a few nights ago, bro? You were supposed to get my back, but you ran. What happened? But that's not what he did. It was not words of correction. It was not words of condemnation. It was words of affirmation. Jesus looked Peter in the eye and said, Peter, do you love me? He said, oh, you know I love you, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, you know I love you. He says it again. He says it three times. Do you love me, Peter? You know I love you, Lord. Jesus met Peter in his failure and lifted him out of it with dignity. The beautiful thing about the Christian life is that even in your mess, the Lord of all creation still loves you. Even in the worst day, he meets you there and he wipes you off. It says in the book of Proverbs, the righteous fall seven times and they get back up again. I mean, case in point, you got a guy on a cross who can't do anything good. He's getting ready to die. This is a sinner of sinners. And he looks over to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Jesus is not afraid of your sin. He's not afraid of the mess in your life, but he is there to pick you up. He is there to clean you off. And he is there to pull you to himself. When me and you view repentance the right way, it will keep your head from pride. It'll keep your heart from condemnation. And it'll make it more about what we gain in God than anything that you give up. And that is amazing news. Amazing news. The second thing as we close. Not only is repentance an invitation, but it's also an examination. So John the, the, the baptizer, he calls this word repent to all the people. But then he has a different word of exhortation to some of the other people that come to observe what's going on. Look at verse 7 through 11. Verse 7 through 11, this is what it says. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
So John sees all these people willing to get right with God. They're turning their lives to God and he's baptizing them. He lifts his eyes and he sees another group of people coming. They're riding their donkeys and their horses and all of a sudden he realizes it's the religious folk. It's the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. It's all the religious elite. And they're coming out and John can feel, I'm sure, the tension building up within him because they're not coming out to get baptized. They're coming out to be little spies. You know what I mean? Like these little rats. Like they, they come in to like look and find how they can judge him and, and shut this thing down because they're, they're of a, an elite class and their heritage. And, and so John, speaking truth, he looks at him and he's like, oh, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. As soon as they get close, he says, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? You know what you need to do? You need to bear fruits worthy of repentance. You claim to have a life turned to God but your whole life is out of tune, is what he was saying. John was listening to their life and their life was out of tune. He said, listen, the fruits coming off your life are not in correlation with a life that's been turned to Jesus. Something is wrong here. Something doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? When you have somebody maybe up on stage that can't sing right and you're like, ooh, man, like... That's a little flat. That's a little sharp. You know, like, ooh, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that was John. John was realizing these people who claim all the right things were not actually exuding or, or allowing their lives to, to sound the right way. And so John said, you need to examine what's going on because what you're saying isn't matching what you're doing. You need to bear fruits worthy of repentance. This is just a, a good way for me and you to examine our hearts this morning, by the way. Many of you have already turned your life toward the Lord. But I want you to realize that it's not a one and done thing. The Christian life is one where we are constantly repenting daily, meaning I'm constantly realigning my heart with God. Daily I'm getting up, oh Lord, would you align my heart with you? God, would you draw me near to you? I'm constantly putting in the coordinates of of my heart and I'm I'm realigning my path and readjusting and, and returning these screws of my life to be more in tune with him. It is a daily tuning. The result of me tuning my heart, turning my life to God is what? It's fruits that are worthy of repentance. This morning, I wanted to focus predominantly on your life turning to God. But the second result of that is also important. If your life is turned to God, then your life will look like you've turned your life to God. This isn't hard. If you say you know him, then your life should actually look like you know him. You should have some type of evidence in your life that it's like, oh yeah, they know God. I know they turn their life to God because of everything in their life. I can see that. It's observable. I could eat of that fruit in their life because the evidence is there. And that is simply the message that John was sharing with them. You need to examine what's going on in your life. Look at all of the keys that are there on the piano of your heart. If there is something really bad there, then the answer is this. You need to be specific and go to the Lord about that key, about that that area of your life, and really crank down and churn it. Because that's what happened with that older guy as I end this morning. That that older gentleman, the 85-year-old man that was blind, that walked into my house, that was listening. You know, that that one key that that was really bad, that I told him we could just throw it away. You know, like, it's bad. Don't don't even do it. Um, Put another string in there. This is what he told me. He said, oh, no, no. He he went over there and he started playing that key. He's he's like, donk, 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 donk. And he's like, oh, I, I know that sound. I know that sound. And he got down on the ground with a screwdriver in his hand and he started like, you know, moving around and and he adjusted and he started hitting the note and he got back up there and he said, I think I could fix it. And so then he got his wrench and he started to really churn this, this one screw. And I'm watching him and he's hitting it, dunk, 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 no difference. I'm like, man, this, this thing's gone, it's gone. And he's, like, and he's like, no, just hold on, hold on. You know, and he's like cranking down on this screw, dunk, 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 no difference. I'm like, man, this is gonna break. What are you doing? He's like, I got this. You know, I, I, and he's feeling the string and he's turning and turning and turning and, and dunk, 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 turning. And then, ding, ding, ding. Hey, hey, we're getting somewhere, my man. And then slowly but surely, it was more turning. And then finally, it went in tune. This morning, I, I, I just want to just say this over you. Is there an area of your life that you're struggling in? Is there 
a, a key, a note, uh, something that has just overwhelmed you and you feel like, oh Lord, I, this area of my life. The answer is simple. You just need to turn it over to the Lord. You need to turn it over to the Lord. Well, I've already done that. Turn it again. I've already tried that. Turn it harder. Keep it turning. The Holy Spirit of God is the sanctifier of our life. He is the one that comes in. It is his job, his rule. We invite him into our life. And he's the one that's sanctifying and molding and shaping and doing his work upon our lives and our hearts and our mind and our mouths. And, And this is a part of being a Christian is that we fully surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, would you put me in tune with you? All areas the dark areas that nobody else knows and the the ones that people see. Lord, would you put me in tune with you? And there he starts his turning work, his turning work upon your heart. And so today you're saying, but I'm a mess, Jason. Turn to God. I keep failing and messing up. Turn to God. I'm battling. Turn to God. I have this one area that's really bad. Just keep turning to God. The Lord loves you. The Lord will meet you there. But turn your life to God. One of the most impressive verses that stood out to me in the 75 that dealt with repentance was Romans 2.4. This is what it says. It's the, do you not know that it is the, the loving kindness of God that leads a man to repentance? When I think about all that God has done for me, when I think about the amazing ways that he's shown his love to you, Why would you not want to turn your heart to him? Why would you not want to turn your heart to him? Nobody's ever loved you like God loves you. Nobody knows you as fully as God knows you. And it's the loving kindness of God that would move your heart toward him. Our greatest need is just to look more at God. In so doing, our heart gets turned. Our life gets cleaned up. Music comes out. People get drawn to him because of the work that he's doing in us. Friends, let the Holy Spirit of God do the churning, the work on your life. Let him tune you up today. Let let him cause that that difference in your life. And oh, what a difference it'll make. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do in you this year as he tunes you up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for my, f- my friends here today as we just look at your word and, and examine what it means to turn to you. Lord, it's true. I have not given up anything to what I've gained. Oh, Jesus, I've gained you. Thank you for initiating in my life and, and opening my eyes to see my need for you today. Lord, I pray you would, you would save people in here, that God, you'd pull them in. You would help them turn to you, that you would clean up and tune up our hearts, our lives. Oh, Jesus, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the example we see in scripture. And I just ask that by your spirit, you would do that work in us. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. joining us today in Jesus City. I hope that message really encouraged you or challenged you in your relationship with the Lord to draw near to Him and to use your life for Him. Hey, would you go to our website? You'll find a lot more resourcing and things to encourage you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Just go to JesusCityChurch.com. It's there that you'll find out about events that are happening locally and small groups that are available to you. Other resourcing available online to, again, help you in your relationship with God. You'll even find a place where if the Lord leads you, you can financially support the work that's happening here in Montgomery, Alabama, or wherever you are watching. I want to ask one last favor that you would help get the word out, that you would like, follow, or share the message that you heard today. So we just want to say we love you, we thank you, and we are so blessed that you're part of the Jesus City family. God bless.